Let's talk about the medical school stuff. All right. I think that's really fascinating. Um, I found some videos about like, like there was a, uh, a bill that was trying to get passed in California, for example, where they, they essentially wanted to mandate that medical schools in California required 14 hours of nutrition education throughout the entire curriculum. Like, so if someone was in med school for four years, they, they had to do 14 hours of nutrition education. Mm-hmm. And people went nuts. Uh, they, the, all the medical associations and stuff went nuts. And they knocked it down to seven hours. And they still uh, were going crazy about it. And uh, I found this, this uh, hearing video from, from like a, you know, the government hearing. Mm-hmm. And there was all these different clips of, of uh, the different medical associations, like the uh, uh, California Association. Of, I think it was California Medical Association, the uh, California Association for Family Doctors, um, the Surgeon Association, whatever. They were all like adamantly against having any sort of mandate for nutrition in med school. Mm-hmm. Um even like a seven hour thing for four years, like seven hours. Are you kidding me? Um, so that's, I think, fascinating about uh, the the fact that, that these medical associations are, are so against teaching nutrition mm-hmm. in med school. And then like what's interesting is that, for instance, in my nutrition class that I've taken, um, they don't go over the different forms of a lot of these micronutrients either in like the actual compatibility that a lot of these nutrients have with the human body. The vitamin A that's found in different milks or, you know, um, the calcium that's fortified in a lot of different orange juices and stuff like that, it's not in the right form that your body's going to be able to actually be able to use it. And so I think that's also another aspect that a lot of people need to look at whenever they're looking at their micronutrient intake as well. Yeah, there are basically different forms of all of them, um, especially minerals. Uh, I was actually having a discussion. I was flying out to Miami last week, and I was sitting next to this guy on the plane. We were just talking about stuff. He, you know, he asked what I did, and I, you know, talked, told him about Umzu and stuff. So he was asking these questions about, oh, you know, does, do supplements even work, and like, do they even absorb in your body? And I was like, yeah. Well, if you look at, for for example, uh, magnesium, mm-hmm. uh, there's going to be certain forms of magnesium that are more bioavailable than others. So if you see a label that says magnesium oxide you should probably run the other direction like you don't even waste your money Mm because it's got like a what like a two percent bioavailability or something on it Mm -hmm. it's just a waste of money however if you had like a glycinate or an aspartate or a citrate those are going to be much more highly bioavailable um and he saw the pattern right away he's like okay so stay away from the ides and go with the eights on the on the minerals i yeah. was like yeah actually that, i never really thought about that but yeah, yeah I didn't you're right <laughs> that's like an easy way to think about it i guess because mm-hmm. um, it's same you know the same thing with like selenium or zinc or other other minerals like that like if if you go with the eights you're going to have a higher bioavailability don't go with the ides the mm-hmm. oxide oxides just rust basically yeah pretty much um so yeah that, that was interesting in terms of bioavailability it's like a little mental hack Mm -hmm. reading a label with the med school stuff it's essentially i i think it's important to look at that because most people go to their doctors it however like in our new i think in the younger generations right now they don't trust the really even just like outside of like a a doctor medical system that like they don't trust the medical system as much as our parents did or our grandparents did Mm -hmm. and then um it's the same thing is with like political stuff and really any establishments. It's almost like these new, like our younger generations right now don't really trust it. Mm-hmm. Mass media, whatever. There's, there's this general lack of trust in it. So I don't know if this will be a problem forever, but currently there's, there's this, uh, like a lot of older generations, like our parents and our grandparents, they go to their doctors for health advice. Mm-hmm. And they have regular checkups. They're they're going like once a month or whatever. They're to, you know getting their prescriptions, and um, they ask the doctors for nutrition advice. The problem is that doctors really don't have nutrition education, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of data to back that up. Uh, the uh, The other issue is that um, doctors aren't interested in nutrition. 
and don't trust the education that they do receive about nutrition. And there was actually a a study uh, done on U.S. med schools that showed that there it's since the 1950s, fewer and fewer med students uh, have any sort of interest in nutrition. Uh, and it, they correlated it with the fact that they think that the, the education that, it, that they get on nutrition while they're in med school, whether it's two or seven hours or whatever it is, like woefully low amount, they think that it's wrong. Mm-hmm. So therefore, if they, they, they're like, well, this is, this is nonsense. Like this, you know, I don't trust the quality of this education, this nutrition education that I'm receiving in this, in med school, which I'm paying a lot of money for. Mm-hmm. Um, therefore, like, I don't want to even learn about any of this because it's this is just bad material like, yeah. cl- clearly so even if they don't trust in the first place they, they just don't even want to learn about it mm-hmm. and that's probably because the they probably have good reason to not trust it because it's probably bad information that they're being told they're conditioned to look at the body with a very reductionistic view so they're told to look at all these different symptoms and be able to name one thing that's going wrong um, and then be able to cover that up with a band-aid whether it's a pharmaceutical or a surgery or something like that rather than looking at the body as a whole holistic self-healing organism and then just being able to fill in the gaps that are not allowing it to function at its optimal capacity yeah and one of the issues that kind of um spurs that sort of thinking in in the medical establishment is just the fact that that it's all like specialty based Mm -hmm. so you spend all this time learning about um you know, one area of the body as a specialist or one system in the body as a specialist. And therefore you'll only ever see the body through that lens because that's really all you have a good grasp on, Mm -hmm. Um, which makes sense. I mean, logically it's like, well, I spent $200,000 like going to med school and becoming a hematologist. So like everything I think about is going to be in the view of the blood. Mm -hmm. Um, So, which I mean, it's, it's logical also for, for, reasons of like ego protection from a just like a basic psychological standpoint it's like well i invested all this money into this therefore if i'm if i start like actively questioning that that decision or the validity of like viewing the body through that lens then as like a total healthy um or health solving system then um you know i'm really questioning my own ego my own psychology my own existence my own identity it's just a bad way i think that it's been set up Mm-hmm. It doesn't really serve the patient very well, and it doesn't serve the doctor that well uh, in order to, you know, help the patient, like, become healthy. Um, there's a lot of great things about doctors uh, and and the skills that are developed as a doctor as well. I mean, I've, I've got several doctors in my family who, you know, they're, they're like, they help a lot of people do things. But part of the problem is that, that the way that the education system is set up doesn't really end up serving the customer very well. Mm-hmm. the client, the patient, whatever. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have theories about why that is in the first place. And I mean, part of it, it just seems very extremely obvious that a lot of it is based on, you know, f- the big pharma lobby, really. Mm-hmm. The fact that that uh, the textbooks are funded by pharmaceutical companies, the fact that, that pharmaceutical companies are a huge part of the hospital as a business. Um, the fact that they, I mean, they've been caught a million times doing this stuff, but like all the, the backdoor things that, that pharmaceutical companies do for doctors in terms of money, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's just clear that that's really what uh, is like underlying all of the education in the medical establishment right now. And it makes sense why that wouldn't involve nutrition. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't involve things like focusing on vitamins, minerals, and amino acids and nutrient therapy because... Nutrient therapy is very inexpensive Mm -hmm. and it can solve the problem. So if you can affordably solve your problems by measuring deficiencies and correcting them um, and finding like imbalance patterns and that sort of thing, uh, where do the drugs come in? They they don't, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't need them.